Thank you for tuning in to Movie Geeks United. Rick Roman Waugh started in the film business as a professional stuntman. You probably don't realize it, but you've seen his work in films like Lethal Weapon 2, Hook, and Roadhouse. He moved behind the camera eventually, writing and directing the films Felon, Snitch, and Shot Collar. He's moved into franchise territory with his latest effort. Angel Has Fallen is the third and best installment of the popular action series starring Gerard Butler. In this film, Butler is joined by an all-star cast including Morgan Freeman, Nick Nolte, Jada Pinkett Smith, and Danny Houston. We spoke to Mr. Waugh following the film's opening weekend, which saw it take the top spot at the box office. You know, it, when we set out to do the movie, um, you know, known Jerry Butler for a while, and, and he called me to come in on this, you know, third installment, and his whole mandate was not to make a sequel. He wanted to make something that felt fresh and new, but took the fun, big action spectacle of the first two movies. And, you know, when do you get to come in and put your stamp on a, on a franchise? So I was all in and really wanted to work with him and, you know, and to make it more of an origin story that felt character driven. But the other thing that I really wanted to bring um, to the table is I feel like we've got into a dangerous kind of place um, with um, our action and these big uh, summer movies is we're getting into a place where be- most of our characters now, especially the heroes, are impervious to pain, they're impervious to danger, they're bulletproof. And I feel like there's no more stakes in things anymore. It just feels like it's gotten mindless. And and also in that bigger, faster, more expensive club where everything's just trying to top the last movie. And what I told Jerry is that I said, you know, maybe I'm old school, maybe I'm nostalgic, but I want to get back into when we had characters that um, you showed warts and all, you know, who they were. They had flaws. They were, had flaws. They were, you were empathetic to their journey because they related, we related to them. They felt like they were us. They said, this goes not only back to like, the lethal, you know, the Mel Gibson character in Lethal Weapon and the Danny Glover character, but the John McClane character in Die Hard um, to back to the Jimmy Stewart's and, you know, the Steve McQueen's and the William Holden's and, and on. You know, we had, we, had, we had characters in movies that, again, were complex and felt very real and human. And, you know, I thought that was a really interesting place to take this, you know, where you've got a guy that's been the one-man wrecking crew in two movies and always on offense. And the structure they came up with, turning it into the fugitive, I thought was brilliant because we suddenly put Mike Banning on defense, but we also show that he's dealing with, you know, adrenaline addiction, war addiction, you know, and that he's, you know, been a man carrying the gun since he's been in the Army Rangers and, you know, went into the special uh, in the um, Secret Service right after that, and it's all he's ever known. And very much like a professional athlete, he'll do everything he possibly can to to stay relevant to the detriment of his own health. So you get all these different complexities but hopefully bringing back the way that those, those action movies felt where there was an emotional thrust to them and you, and there was a story to really kind of be invested in. Yeah. And you absolutely did that. And, and uh, I mean, I would think that it would be a tricky thing to combine more interior character stuff with the action that audiences crave nowadays. But, but I find that the character stuff makes you more deeply invested in that action. But even so, when I, I would think reading it on the page, it would be difficult to to calibrate. You know how much is 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 too much of the character stuff. We got to get into the action stuff. You know, in terms of pacing, was that something that you were concerned with, particularly in the editing phase of this? You are in the writing phase as well. You know, I mean, when you've written enough material. Um, you know, over time, you know, and we've been writing for, for obviously, you know, quite a while now, you just start realizing um, a rhythm to a movie. You know, it becomes second nature, whatever the movie may be and the pacing of it, you know, and it all starts in the script format. And, you know, when Matt Cook and I took on this movie, you know, there was a script um, that that was there from Robert Mark Kamen, but really to put my stamp on it, it was a page one, you know, where keeping – somewhat the same structure of it with the, with Mike Bannon becoming the fugitive, but really um, also just going page one through the whole thing. So it totally felt felt like it was my movie, you know, the movie that I wanted to make and 
dealt with all the complex themes and different thing um, and things to it. But you know, again, it it becomes a, hopefully a second nature thing. But yeah, there's a responsibility of when you're trying to have your cake in it too. When you're trying to make a big action movie for the summer, that's going to be this big ass fun ride. Hopefully, it is that you're not weighting it down with too much drama, but you're giving enough of a balance where you feel like you're emotionally invested in these characters, you're rooting for them, you're having a fun ride um, at the same time, and you also feel like it's action that's it back to being in camera and grounded, and, and you feel like you're part of it and a participant in the movie versus just watching something where your eyes glaze over, you know, because it's just nothing but mindless stuff blowing up on the screen. You, you can feel that you're seeing practical stunts, which coming from your background is, is it's apropos. And in terms of shooting action, uh, it feels like you get right in there with, with, with the camera. I mean, what's your approach to, to staging these action sequences? It is, it is about bringing the audience into it and making it immersive. Um, I do that with my narrative as well. I like immediacy. I feel like it, you feel like you're more attached to what is happening um, versus being kind of back away from it, you know, and, and, and unattached. And, you know, when I took on this movie, you know, and I talked to Vic Armstrong and Greg Powell, who are my second year director and stunt coordinator, I said, look, you know, we've all been doing this for a very long time. We all come from the stunt world. You know, I don't really care about showing our technical prowess. I'll leave that up to you guys. What I want to do is bring the audience along on the ride so that they feel like they're inside the action with our characters. They're in it with Mike Banning. They're in it with Morgan Freeman as Alan Trumbull. They're in it with Clay Banning. And so you feel like you're in the semi chases and you're in the drone attack and you're in these firefights and make it more immersive for the audience. So again, they feel like a participant, you know, not just watching something on the screen, but they actually feel like they're a part of it. Yeah. And I had heard you say that, uh, Tony Scott was a mentor for you, and I was wondering what what particularly yeah. you 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 took from him. Tony's fearlessness of his own brand. He knew he didn't try to emulate anyone. He went into everything that he did and tried to make it original, not self indulgent, but a point of what was the best way to tell that story and being fearless about it. That if it lives or dies. Um, it's live it or die by the sword because it's, you know, me wielding it, not by me trying to mimic somebody else or copy things or whatever else. And I think that having the confidence or, or hopefully having the confidence to be original and do your own thing and then really um, come up with your own brand, I think that is by far the biggest life lesson I got from Tony and also my other mentor, Jerry Bruckheimer, you know, you go to this day and you watch a movie, um, and it's a Jerry Bruckheimer movie, you know it's a Jerry Bruckheimer movie. And you knew that about a Tony Scott movie as well, you know, and hopefully yeah. I'm kind of hopefully continuing some form of that legacy. Well, that, you know, I find that in your movie as well. There's, And I really miss, <clears throat> just as a movie fan, I miss Tony Scott for his for his fearlessness. Yeah. And I, I, he was so great at making mass or entertainment that appealed to the masses. And yet at the same time, I think what's overlooked about him is he, he seemed to be a very experimental filmmaker. I mean, there are moments in his movie, in his movies where you're thinking, this is, this is pretty avant-garde in a way. I mean, the, the way he's, he's staging and setting up the cameras and what is he doing with the titles? Uh, it, it, it's, it's just a pastiche of like originality, like you said. I really miss that. Yeah. And I never and I never felt like he did it as an indulgence. You know, I think there are filmmakers out there that want to show what their technical prowess. But Tony didn't really give a shit about any of that. Tony just cared about what is the coolest way, what is a really interesting way to tell a story. I, the way they came up with the cameras on Man on Fire was because he wanted to get internal in those moments and feel these different moments and create different rhythms. And he's a studier, you know, of our of of filmmaking, you know, and these different type of um, formats and things that you can do. And, you know, and I try not to get too far, like, and, and again, because my style is very different from Tony's and hopefully it's very different from anybody else's. Hopefully my, my style is unique to me, you know, liver, um, for good or for worse, you know, better for worse. But it, it, it's about figuring out what is your bread and butter and what, what you do. And, you know, my thing is it's always wanting to know what the hook is and, stories that deal in the moral gray of society. You know, I never really deal with black and white characters. They've always got some kind of 
chink in their armor or some angst that they're dealing with or flaws that they're dealing with or or being coerced into something of us wondering, God, could I do that? Because could I become a violent person in prison to, to survive? Um, could I coerce others to save my son, um, you know, from mm-hmm. doing prison time? And in, and in you know, um, Angel Has Fallen, it's really about war addiction that when we're, you know, we're in, we're in a, a war right now, which is the longest combat campaign in American history, let alone the world, you know, there's a new version of post-traumatic stress that is taking place. You know, we made a documentary on it called That Which I Love Destroys Me, and it's about war addiction. You know, when you subject anybody to this amount of combat, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of missions, some people have been going on for almost two decades now, you know, in straight fighting, straight combat. Your brain gets wired to that. It doesn't know how to deal in the calm of society anymore. War is home. And so it was a really interesting leaping point to take Mike Banning and Wade Jennings, two men who fought alongside each um, um, in the Army Rangers, you know, in special operations in Iraq, came home. One decided to go into law enforcement because he only knew how to hold the gun and wanted to keep that, that adrenaline going. And the other one chose private contracting and got back right back into the war as a private contractor because he wanted to get even closer to the dragon. And, you know, it's how those two things evolve and the, the, the parallels that they, that they have, but also – the, the, the conflicting points of view and conflicting, um, um, you know, agendas. And so I think those, what, those are the things that interest me. It's always about really pushing things into this moral gray of society and, and how we would want to know through vicariously living through others, you know, and how we would deal with things. Yeah, and not to be too pretentious about it, but they, they do father and son. They do see the parallels in one another, but they, it, but they also get to a point uh, – where they're they're able to kind of try to work to to heal one another, because in a way they're on they're on the same journey, but just at kind of different stages of the same journey. Yeah, one you know the father, much to his chagrin, realizes that his son is not running away from war that he did, like he did. He's running. He's trying to run back into war. He's trying to do everything he can to stay relevant, but they're still affected and. Um, we always talk, you know, Nick and I and Jerry about that. The first thing that they connect about is they connect as warriors. They don't connect as father and son. They never had that. Um, that's not that's not something that's innate. That's not the the primary thing that's innate about their about their relationship anymore. It's being warriors. It's being two men that have seen combat, have seen life and death, and have been in war. That they see each, they see that in each other's eyes, and it's the first connective tissue that, that starts their healing process. Yeah. And was Nick Nolte just kind of an obvious choice? I mean, because he's, I mean, my God, his performance in this movie. He was the only choice. Exceptional actor. Yeah, no, when he said yes, man, I jumped up and down because there was nobody else in that for me. Like, he was the guy. You know, he was Clay Manning. Do you have, I'm sure you have a good Nick Nolte story because I don't think there are any other kind of Nick Nolte stories except good ones. (laughs) Yeah, you know, he's all in. I mean, that's the one thing about him that I figured out real quick. You know, he is um, he is extremely articulate. He comes very well prepared. He's very in-depth of what the, the, the character was and um, the history of it and so forth. But you, you just see a guy that wants to come every day and he's passionate. The funny story that, you know, you've already seen the, the kind of great push and pull that he and Jerry had together. And, you know, the one scene where he's on the porch and, you know, and he and his son just had it out about quitting life and, you know, and what happened. And then Mike, you know, um, ends up calling Wade Jennings and is having this phone call. Well, Nick was always supposed to stay on the porch and just shout, you know, and he ended up jumping off that porch and got right up into Jerry's face. And next thing you know, Jerry had to kind of muzzle him. And, you know, all that's real. That's just because they're in the moment doing their thing. And I was laughing afterwards and, you know, Nick and I were walking back over to the, uh, um, to the porch and he said, yeah, yeah did I jump off that porch? And I said, yeah, you jumped off that porch. He goes, oh, my God. He goes, I don't think I've jumped since 1972. <laughs> you know, and he just <laughs> always had a way of that, you know, of just where I got to tell you, you know, we had a phenomenal cast and everybody became family. But the, when, when it was Nick Nolte's last day, I mean, I, I, know, I know for a fact that there were some tears in people's eyes on that crew. They just, we just loved him to death. He was just such an amazing human being to be around. Um, Morgan Freeman, uh, his intensity is a little different. There's, 
and I, it reminds me of a story that I heard Dennis Hopper tell years ago when he directed Robert Duvall in Colors, and he was he was looking through the through through the monitor and he couldn't see Duvall doing anything, and and he said, right. "Could you be more, a little bit more animated?" And Duvall said, "Just look at the brushes. You'll you'll see what I'm doing." It was so uh, finely tuned to the camera that you couldn't see it with the naked eye standing right in front of him. Is is Morgan Freeman right. that kind of actor? That kind of subtlety from him? He is. There's just so much going on internally and in his confidence of who he plays. And you know, we always wanted this to be uh, um, a movie about two, uh, two fathers and a son, you know, one being blood, one not one being the protector um, and the protected becoming like family because of the journey of those two people and the evolution of their characters, but also the fact that this loyalty and trust that takes place between the protector and the protected, but also this paternal sense of the Morgan Freeman character, the Alan Trumbull character that, you know, we're going to find out in the, in the third branch, in the third installment, why Mike Banning has, um, took to him and also has this sense of abandonment from a father that, you know, that he's been chasing all these years. And maybe that's a lot where his anger and his proponent to, you know, to, to violence comes from. And so, you know, with Morgan, what we wanted the movie to feel like is we didn't want it to be political. We wanted it to feel like, um, relevant, you know, and as much as people would say we maybe mirrored what's going on modern day, you know, we argue, go look in the history all the way back to Abraham Lincoln, you know, like every cabinet, every administration had these things going on and on the complexities of the job. But it was also about where we felt like in a world that is becoming so crazy that, you know, we wanted to bring dignity back to it, you know, and his kind of sense of that he already brings that and this nobility to things that only Morgan Freeman can do. And they are, they're very minimal the way that he does, his, you know, that he projects his performances. Yeah, it's very powerful. And finally, you have already shot your next movie and it stars Gerard Butler. Uh, it's yeah. Greenland? Yeah, we were, you know, like I mentioned, you know, Jerry and I had been wanting to work together for a while and when we finally got on the set of Angel, you just never know if you're going to have um, chemistry or not. You think you might, but you just never know until you're really in it. And, you know, we just really hit it off as filmmaker and star. And, um, and, and you know, by the time we were almost done with Angel, we were really trying to figure out what could we do next. And we wanted to do something different. And, you know, if Angel has fallen as the inside-out version of an action movie where it's all char- from character internally, but this big scope around it, you know, we found this script called Greenland that's basically the same thing for a disaster film where it's about a comet that is supposed to go by the Earth until people realize it's actually not going to go by, it's going to hit, and it's, it could be the next planet killer. And it's about this family that is chosen for um, re, um, relocation to a, to a bunker in Greenland and um, in their journey about how humanity will collapse and what people are capable of, you know, when it's the end of the world and you know, and, and it's life or death, you know, will good people do bad things and bad people do good things? Will we become selfish or selfless? And, you know, what I loved about the material, and I told Jerry, as I said, everybody always says that my prison movies, you know, they show how far people will go with their own morality, you know, within prison because it's so violent in there. And I'm like, well, it's not the prison that does it. It's people, you know, it's, it's humanity in its own self. And so this is um, a way to show that same thing in a, in a, in a, um, in a disaster movie, you know, the inside out version that where you feel like you're more intimate, um, similar to a quiet place. I think a quiet place really did that where you felt like you're with that family, not about the monsters, but this, that was the, that was the, that was the, that was the thing chasing them. Yeah. And you're, you're in post with that right now, right? Yeah. My first week of the director's cut. So it's been fun to kind of switch gears now and, you know, and, um, um, you know, and um, see, Angel has fallen, doing so well, and you know. And my favorite thing is just seeing where the um, where audiences are really having a great time with it, you know. And to see them clap and cheer and be emotionally invested in it, you know, it's it's everything. It's a dream come true to see them so kind of attached to, you know, the ride of everything. So uh, it's been a it's been a yeah. blessing for sure. And now you know, getting my focus back here on Greenland. Yeah. Did you did you walk in any theaters over the opening weekend to to, to gauge audience reaction? To Angel? We've been in a few. I, yeah, I've been in a few. I mean, my first one that was obviously 
um, nervous as hell was uh, I screened for the Secret Service and first responders in Washington, wow. D.C. And, you know, that and that was a fantastic experience. They really appreciated the movie and totally got the fun of it, but also, you know, that it related to them, that they felt like, you know, we were showing the dangers of the, of the law enforcement and first responder community and what they go through. And then, you know, from the premiere and to the other um, screenings we've had and to see the general public, you know, there's been a lot of sneak screenings that we've kind of popped in and looked at and, it's really fun to see people just go for the ride and have a great time. Well, congratulations on it, my friend. And, and, and thank you so much for talking to me tonight. I appreciate it. It was a great interview. Thank you very much.